Hi, in this lecture, what we're going to do is discuss the first uh, foundation lectures with respect to capital structure policy. Now, and we start with what's called the MM propositions or the Modigliani and Miller propositions. So this lecture is very important because it is the bedrock of capital structure policy from a theoretical perspective. Now, so everything that we know about capital structure policy recently you know, builds upon the, Modiglina, the Modigliani and Miller propositions, okay, which are the dogma, the foundational dogma for capital structure policy. So for this video, that's the objective for us to be able to understand what was the proposed capital structure policy under uh, Modigliani and Miller. Okay. So let's have an example. So for example, we are looking at a at an firm with 100% equity, okay? So it is an it is equity, uh, this firm is owned by a shareholder and the funding comes from equity 100%. So for example, we're considering a project you know, of, uh, which has the following characteristics. So for an initial investment of $800 this year, the project will generate cash flows of either $1,400 or $900 next year, depending on whether the economy is strong or weak, respectively. And both scenarios are equally likely. Since these scenarios are equally likely, the probability of a strong economy happening is 50%. And the probability of a weak economy happening is also 50%. So if you want to plot down the cash flows with respect to this project, okay, it is this way. No? At date zero or time zero, there's an outflow of 800. And on date one or one year after, no, it will either be a strong economy where in the cash flow will be 1,400. No? or a weak economy where the cash flow will be 900, okay? Uh, in this case, the cash flows depend on the overall economy and thus contain market risk. And since it contains market risk, we expect you know, that the, the discount rate for the project is not equal to the risk free rate, right? I say, obviously, there is some inherent risk because there's an element of a strong and weak economy, okay? So this is just reviewing or connecting to your, to your capital budgeting and uh, tap in discussions, okay? As a result, for example, you demand a 10% risk premium over the current risk-free rate of 5% to invest in this project. So if that's the case, if that's the, case the required rate of return, no? your required rate of return for this project will be the risk-free rate plus the risk premium, okay? So the risk-free rate is what? 5% and the risk premium is 10% and therefore your required rate of return is 15%, okay? So given these characteristics, these kinds of cash flow profile and this kind of rate of return, you can get the NPV of the firm, okay? And that's what we'll do in the next slide, okay? So here, we have already discussed that the cost of capital is 15%, and that's five plus 10%. And the expected cash flow in one year is what? The probabilities are 50, 50. And given that a strong economy's cash flow is 1,400, a weak economy is 900, and therefore the expected cash flow after one year is 1,150. And with that, we can get the NPV of the project, right? This is time one, this is time two, time zero rather, okay? So therefore getting the NPV of the project, the NPV of the project is 200. Let us investigate this NPV. Okay, what is the meaning of this NPV? Okay, for paying for paying eight hundred dollars, okay, no, you will receive an asset which will you will you will build an asset 
that allows you to generate 1150 of cash flows, which, it, which in present value terms is worth $1,000. Okay. So here we can say that $1,000 is the value of the asset, and therefore it is the value of the project and also called value of the firm. Okay. Right? The asset that you build is expected to generate $1,000. So that $1,000 is called the firm value or asset value of the firm. Okay. So therefore, if I'm going to sell this asset, you know, um, eventually, I mean, if I'm, I'm going to sell this asset, it should be worth 1,000, right? Because the expected benefit from these assets is $1,000, okay? And remember, in this case, okay, a very important uh, assumption that you should not forget is that the firm is 100% financed by equity, right? So going by the accounting equation, asset equals liabilities plus equity, but liability is zero. So in this case, asset equals equity. And if the value of your assets okay, is equal to $1,000, then the value of your equity is also $1,000, right? So if you look at, since project cash flows is equal to equity cash flows, the value of assets, or the value of the firm is equal to the value of equity. So therefore, you can raise funding. You can raise 1,000 pesos by selling 100% of equity in the firm, right? Simply because of this fundamental relationship. Since it's a 100% equity firm, it means there's no liabilities and therefore the value of assets, which is 1,000, okay? is equal to the value of equity, which is also $1,000, okay? That's the fundamental um, relationship if we are dealing with a, with a full equity firm or 100% equity firm, okay? So this kind of, uh, this kind of company that is 100% equity financed we refer to it as unlevered equity. Unlevered because there's no leverage, no? and therefore it, it, is, uh, it, it refers to a similar firm where all of its assets are financed by equity. And if you have an unlevered equity no? or an unlevered firm, it implies no? that the value of an unlevered DU here is value of an unlevered firm is equal to B is equal to EU, which is the value of unlevered equity. The key item here to consider is that both items are unlevered due to debt. So because there is no debt, the cash flows of equity are equal to the to those of the project, okay? Kasi wala na ibang pabayaran eh. So all cash flows relating to the asset actually accrue to the shareholders, right? Because there's nothing, there, wala na babayaran na iba. So therefore, lahat ng cash flows na 1100.05, okay? Yung 1105 with the, with the present value of, um, with the present value of $1,000, Ang may arik nun lahat are the shareholders, right? Because they they don't have to pay any debt, so they receive the full benefit out of the project's cash flows. Okay, okay. So that's what unlevered firms is, and what that's what unlevered F, unlevered equity is. So this relationship is very important because this will build on the Bigliani and Miller propositions. Okay. Now here, let's uh, let's let's uh, check no 
the returns of equity under both scenarios. Okay? The returns of equity holders under both scenarios. So if the value of unlevered equity down is $1,000 as we have determined you know, because the value of the firm or an unlevered firm is 1000 and because value of, it, of an unlevered firm is equal to the value of its equity, then the value of equity now is also $1,000, okay? So that's the value now. Under a strong economy, one year after, cash flows will be 1400 right? Or, okay, if the economy is weak, the cash flows will be 900 okay? Given those cash flows, you can compute the returns under a strong economy or a weak economy. So under a strong economy, how was the 40% computed? No. The equity holders will receive one four, and their current equity value is 1,000, and therefore you can get 40%, 400 over 1,000. Ito naman sa weak economy, that's 900 minus 1,000 divided by 1,000. Okay? And given this, we know that these are these have equal probabilities. Diba? So therefore, 40% times 50% probability plus negative 10% times 50% will give you what? Okay? Will give you 15%, which is your required rate of return. Okay? That required rate of return, 15%, is what we call the unlevered return. Okay? Which simply means this is the return required by owners of, unle of an unlevered firm. And we usually refer to it as RU or RA. RU means return of an unlevered firm. Or, or it is also equal to RA, which is the return of, on the assets of the project, okay? Which we will discuss in greater detail later. Right? So here I've already computed this. No? Um, the shareholders return are either 40 or negative 10, and therefore the actual return is 15%. No? And since the cost of capital of the project is 15%, cost of capital or the required rate of return is 15%. Then shareholders are earning an appropriate return for the risk they are taking in the unlevered equity. Okay, so before we move on to levered equity, let me just recap what are the key relationships that we are uh, dealing with here you know, that are very important. Okay, number one is the concept that the, va the value of an unlevered firm is equal to the value of the equity of an unlevered firm or value of an unlevered firm is equal to the value of the equity of, an, of its unlevered equity, okay? That's the first characteristic or first, um, first foundational knowledge that we need to understand before we introduce the concept of debt, okay? Second, okay, the return on the assets, okay? of the project is equal to the return on the equity of the project, simply because there is no debt, diba? So kung ano man yung return on the project in terms of its assets, that's the same return that the equity holders are going to receive, diba? Since it's identical cash flow, okay? So here, the foundation and kaya ito nangyari is because the cash flows of the firm or the cash flows of the project or the asset okay, is equal to the cash flows approving to owners. Why is it equal? 
okay, because there is no debt. So all cash flows generated by the project ultimately accrues to the shareholders. Diba? Walang ibang may-ari ng cash flow na yan kundi yung mga may-ari. Hindi sila inaallocatean. Wala silang ibang inaallocatean na ibang tao. Because the cash flows that the project generates after paying off any investment cost to purchase those assets, all residual cash flows go to the shareholders. So, therefore, we can say that the cash flows of the assets or the project is equal to the cash flows accruing to the owners or shareholders. And because of that, the value of the asset is equal to the value of equity. So the value of the firm is equal to the value of equity. Okay. And second, since the cash flows are the same, the return that we get out of the project is the same return that we get as shareholders. Okay. Because they're all based in the same based on the same cash flows. So that's the fundamental, um, I guess, fundamental treaty or fundamental aspect with respect to uh, the valuation of an unlevered firm. Okay? Now, let's introduce debt in the equation. Now, let's look at the cash flows of a company, okay? If we introduce debt in the equation, so you suppose you decide to borrow $500 initially in addition to selling those equity. Okay, so it is the same company. Okay, so the company, ganun pa rin, the company will receive $1,150 expected cash flows after a year. No, the asset value, the asset investment cost is still. 800, okay? Ang naiba lang, yung 800 before, no? you want all of this to be funded by equity. Ngayon, there's debt. $500 will be um, borrowed. Okay? Now, because the project's cash flow will always be enough to repay the debt, for simplicity's sake, the debt is risk-free. And de therefore, they can borrow at the risk free interest rate of 5%. No? After a year, what will be the outflow? Okay. After the year, a year, the outflow will be 525, which includes $25 of interest. Ang nagaling yung $25 na yun dito. That's 500 times 5%. $25, which is the interest that you have to pay, which is equivalent to the 5% risk free rate. Okay, and uh, that's the situation now. In the next slide, we'll discuss the cash flow. So just some terminology. Here, the equity naman that we are talking about here, no, since my debt component na, yung equity, we refer to it as levered equity. Okay, so yung unlevered equity, it means equity in a firm with zero debt. Yung levered equity, ang tawag dyan is equity, yung definition dyan is equity in a firm with leverage. So yung example natin kanina, no, yung $1,000 kanina, ang tawag natin dyan is unlevered equity. Okay? Here, the equity that we will be dealing in this example it's called levered equity. Okay. So let's now uh, let's now discuss the cash flows, you know, so that we can get to know the relationship better. You know? So given the firm's five hundred twenty-five dollar debt obligation after a year, your shareholders will not receive the whole one one o five, right? Why is that the case? Kasi kailangan mo magbayad ngayon ng 525 to your 
uh, to your obligate to, to your lenders to, no so dati ang sinasabi natin the cash flows of an unlevered firm is equal to the cash flows received by its owners right now if there's leverage this is not the case right because after a year for example the firm will receive one fourth if it's a strong economy but your equity will not receive one fourth right why because 525 kailangan bayaran yung debt right and so therefore the cash flows to equity no cash flows that will be received by your equity holders will only be 875 rather than 525 okay tama ba yan right at that day yung unlevered firm pa okay, your equity would have received 900 dollars in a weak economy pero ngayon di ba ano na siya hindi na pwede yon okay bakit hindi na pwede yon right kasi you have to pay 525 to your lenders Therefore, the, the cash flow received by levered equity is now 375. Okay? So, the cash flows are different. So, the same relationship na value of the firm equals value of equity will not be um, will not be valid anymore. Right? Simply because the cash flows are different. So, obviously, the value will be very much. Different. Now the question is, what now is what now will be the value of levered equity? Kung hindi na sila equal, eh ano na, magkano na, right? So that's the first question. Second question is, given that it's like this, what's the best capital structure choice for the entrepreneur in this case? So let's discuss it in the next slides. No, so. This is the foundation of the Modigliani and Miller proposition, the first proposition. Okay. Uh, ang sagot daw, according to Modigliani and Miller, so that's Franco, Modigliani, and uh, I forgot the name of Miller, pero they have a lot of um, papers on capital structure policy. Okay. They argued that with perfect capital markets, no, it's a BN. Uh, no transaction cost, there's no market imperfection, no. Uh, the total value of a firm should not depend on its capital structure. Okay? What was the reason behind it? They reasoned that the firm's total cash flows will still equal the cash flows of the project and therefore have the same present value. Makes sense, right? Okay. In an unlevered scenario, okay, what is the cash flow that they will receive? One that the firm, the company, the project will receive. One one fifty dollars per in, right? If it is levered, what cash flow will the project receive? The same. One one fifty. Remember, ang nag-iba cash flow na marireceive ng equity ng owners. But the project itself will still receive the same cash flow. Correct? So that's number one. Okay, same cash flows. Second, nagbago ba yung risk profile ng project? Hindi, right? Kunyari, yung project mo is a gas plant. No? Yung gas plant ba dahil nagkaroon ng debt, naging more risky yung project itself? Hindi. It's the same kind of assets, right? Wala naman nagbago sa how ko paano siya papatakbuhin. Nagbago ba yung market because there's debt? No, it's they're still facing the same competitive pressures as before. So, so therefore, same cash flows, same risks. And therefore, if same risks, it means that the required rate of return should not change. No, as far as the project is concerned. Correct? So therefore, if it's the same cash flows, the same risks, Therefore, under the law of one price, okay, no, then dapat the value of an unlevered firm is equal to the value of a levered firm. Remember, we're talking about firm here or project. 
or assets. Pare-pareho yan. No? Since we're talking about these things, okay, um, they have the same cash flows or payoffs, they have the same characteristics, and therefore, they should be priced the same. Therefore, the value of an unlevered firm is equal to the value of a levered firm. Nag-iiba lang yung composition, paano sila napunduhan. Right? No? So therefore, the combined values of debt and equity under the levered firm scenario should be equal to 1,000. Okay? Kuha ba yun? So that's the fundamental characteristic, fundamental um, rule. No? The value of the firm never changes regardless of the capital structure. No? Bakit? Because they have the same payoff, they have the same, same cash flows, and it didn't fundamentally change the risk of the project. Right? Pareho pa rin yung business makeup regardless of whether it is debt or equity financed. So, same cash flows, same discount rate, and so therefore, no, they have the same value. And therefore, in our example, let's go back to this slide. We know that the value of the firm is still $1,000 under that scenario, okay, at time zero. Okay. If that's the case, and we know that the value of debt today is 500, kasi yan yung inutang mo today, therefore, the value of your equity is $500 also. Okay? So that we keep the relationship that the value of the firm is equal to the value of equity, that's the value of debt. All right? Which is in keeping with the Modigliani and Miller propositions. Okay? Let's try to explore this more in the next slide. No. Now, because the cash flows of a levered equity is smaller than those of its unlevered counterpart, obviously, levered equity will sell for a lower price than unlevered equity. Kasi mas mababa na yung cash flow niya. Okay? If you remember, yung unlevered equity, ang cash flow niya, 1,150. Right? Which is 1,4 under a good economy. And uh, uh, 900 under a bad economy. All right? Yung, yung levered firm, ano na yung cash flow niya? Hindi na 1,150. Right? Bakit? Sa good, it's 1,4 minus 5,2,5. Okay? Sa bad, that's 900 minus 5,2,5. Obviously, there's a 5,2,5 difference. And therefore, the cash flows of the levered firm here is smaller. No? And therefore, the value of equity, which is 500, okay, will also be smaller. Does that mean that you are worse off since you are this is the value of your equity is lower? No? You are not worse off. Why are you not worse off? Because you're still be able to raise one thousand dollars, right? However, na bago lang yung sources. Okay. Uh, hindi ibig sabihin you cannot raise one thousand dollars. Nagbago lang yung yung pieces of the pie. Okay you would be indifferent between these two choices of capital structure because you can still raise the same amount. Okay. So here, a very important characteristic is the value of the firm is equal to the value of debt and value of equity. Specifically here, what kind of firm? A levered firm. Okay. And since the value of a levered firm is the is equal to the value of a levered firm, then VN equals VU. Okay. So Bodigliani and Miller established their result with the following argument. So number one, in the absence of taxes or other transaction costs, the total cash flow paid out to all of the firm security holders is equal to the total cash flow generated by the firm's asset. Parang sinasabi nila, hmm, 
sa unlevered nagproduce ng 1150. Yang 1150 na yan na allocate lang sa equity holders dati. Ngayon, under a levered scenario, 1150 pa rin naman yung matatanggap eh in total. Na allocate lang into two debt and equity. Right? So, actually, kung ganun, the value of the firm should be the same because the cash flows are the same. Ang magbabago yung value of equity because the cash flow of value of equity to the cash flow of equity is different. No? So, the value of the company should be the same and unaffected by the kind of securities which finance it. Okay? Again, because of the law of, law of one price. Okay? Another component okay, of uh, the Modigliani and Miller proposition is homemade leverage, which we'll discuss in the next slides. Okay? So when investors use leverage in their own portfolios to adjust the leverage choice made, of, made by the firm. Parang sinasabi ng Modigliani and Miller Proposition 1 is hindi nagmamatter whether a, a firm is has debt or equity. It won't increase the value of that company. Okay? Bakit? Kasi, kasi the portfolio holders or kung sino man yung may-ari can always alter the equity. No, effective equity of its investment. Kasi pwede siyang mahutang on his own. Right? So for example, kung, ma kung mag invest ka in an unlevered firm, fine, there's no leverage. Pero yung investor who put the money in an unlevered firm can always borrow on his own. Right? And because he can borrow on his own, even though the unlevered firm, he invested in an unlevered firm, uh, at the end of the day, he can have leverage. No? by investing or by borrowing on his own to mimic the kind of leverage that he wants. Okay? And if that's the case, then uh, leverage of a company should not, should not matter to, to investors. Wala siyang sense sa investors kasi kaya naman niyang gumawa ng sariling leverage if gusto niya. Paano mangyayari yun? Okay? Let's consider the next examples. So here, what we do is we demonstrate homemade leverage or what we call replicating portfolios. Okay. So for example, um, you are investing 1%. You are investing 1% of an unlevered firm. So merong unlevered firm. So dahil unlevered siya, it's 100% equity. Right? Okay. And since it's 100% equity, you plan to invest 1% of that 100% equity. Okay. Baga, 1% shareholder ka of a firm with no debt. Okay. The challenge is, uh, kaya mo rin bang i-replicate ang isang unlevered firm, ang investment in an unlevered firm by investing in a levered firm? In other words, uh, in other words, this is one scenario, diba, that you will be investing in an unlevered firm. Can I replicate the same return by investing in a levered firm? Okay, let's investigate that. If you're investing 1% of an unlevered firm, therefore you own 1% of the equity of that unlevered firm, how much are you going to invest? 1% of the value of equity. Okay? So here, the value of equity is equal to the value of an unlevered firm. Right? So therefore, if you plan to invest 1% of the value of equity, no? therefore, you are investing 1% times the value of an unlevered firm. Baba? So that's the investment. Okay. Now, how much return are you going to get out of this 1% investment in an unlevered firm? You will get 1% of the profit of an unlevered firm. 
Diba? Kung ano man yung profit nila, 1% of yan sa'yo. Okay? And the profit of an endeavored firm is the profit of the project. Correct? Kasi um, wala namang interest na babayaran. So parang ito yung EBIT. EBIT but interest is zero. Right? So para tong Ayan, EBIT but interest is zero. Okay? So that's the base case. Can I replicate the same cash flows by investing in a levered firm instead? Yes. How do I do it? You can replicate it by, number one, you invest 1% in, in the equity of a levered firm. Okay? You can replicate that by investing also in 1% of the debt. No, magpahiram ka equivalent to 1% of the total debt requirement of that levered firm. Okay? Remember, value of a levered firm is equal to the value of its equity plus the debt. Okay? So, to be able to properly replicate the investment, okay, ang sinasabi is, para makapag-invest ka sa 1% ng value of a levered firm, you should be able to present to invest in 1% of equity plus 1% of debt of that firm. All right? So, yun yung ginawa natin. So, nagpahir nagpahiram tayo ng pera, 1% ng total requirement. Nagpa then, nag-invest din tayo ng pera in the form of equity, 1% of the total requirement. If you add the two, that's actually 1% of DL plus DL. Diba? I mean, algebraically. Okay? And you know that DL plus EL is equal to DL or the value of the levered firm. Okay? And so that is the first thing that we need to do. Okay? Now, we don't know. We have not, we have not um, demonstrated yet you know, that DL is equal to VU. So technically, magkaiba pa sila ngayon. Right? But in the next part, we will demonstrate that they are the same. Okay? Now, let's look at the return. After one year, if, kung nagpahiram ka ng, kung nagpautang ka sa levered firm, what will you get? Okay? You will get 1% of the total interest paid by a levered firm. Diba? Kasi nagpautang ka ng 1% sa kanila. Right? 1% of total requirements debt requirements, and therefore you will also get 1% of total interest. Correct? Okay. And if you invested in equity, you will also get the 1% of equity of a 1% of the profit of a levered firm. Okay? Correct? Okay. Therefore, in total, what did you receive? You received 1% of the profit of a lev levered firm and the interest paid by a levered firm. Okay? So, if you add the two, iba ang profit of a levered firm, essentially, that is EBIT minus interest minus tax, profit of a levered firm. Right? If you add back interest, then it becomes the EBIT without interest. Since it's EBIT without interest, it means that the profit here that we are talking about, this portion, okay, is actually equal to the profit that we are talking about here. Because this EBIT, no, the interest is also zero, right? E dito, anong ginawa natin nung na-add siya? Na-cancel yung interest. So interest is also zero. So actually, this portion is equal to this portion they have the same payoff, right? They have the same cash flows or return. And under the law of one price, assets with the same cash flows should have the same value. Therefore, this investment is equal to this investment. 
ultimately what did we do we were able to replicate you no know, the cash flows of an unlevered firm using a levered company okay and that's what we call homemade leverage or replicating portfolio no because i as the investor i can create my own leverage okay so actually ang nangyari is ang nangyari here is tinanggal ko yung leverage right bakit no uh, i invested in a company na levered okay in effect my portfolio now become becomes unlevered okay kasi yung cash flow na to is equal sa cash flow ng isang unlevered firm kuha ba So that's the essence of a replicating portfolio. And why is this important? This is important because it shows that the value of a levered firm is equal to a value to the value of a levered firm. And therefore, debt does not matter in capital structure policy. Okay? All right. I'll give you more time to process that. This is a little bit complicated, but I think it perfectly illustrates, you no? Know, the concept of uh, the Modigliani and Miller Proposition 1. Okay? Now, let's try to discuss it differently naman. No? Let's try to create no, a levered position from an, an, from an investment in an unlevered firm. Okay? That's... So, using an unlevered firm to replicate a levered position. Okay? So for example, naman, let's do it let's do it the reverse. Okay. Assume you are investing 1% of equity in a levered firm. If you are investing 1% of equity in a levered firm, your investment is 1% of equity. Right? Remember that value of a levered firm is equal to debt plus equity of a levered firm. Okay. So this position is equal to 1% of VL minus DN, which is equal to equity. Okay? And 1% of profit of a levered firm is equal to 1% of the profit of an unlevered firm minus the interest that the levered firm pays. Okay? Now that is what we want to replicate. Now you can replicate this position using an investment in an unlevered company. How do we do that? Now we invest equity, 1% of the value of, so here naman the relationship is value of an unlevered firm is equal to the equity of an unlevered firm. Okay? So we want to invest 1% times VU, okay, which is the value of an unlevered firm, because that is also equal to the value of equity of an unlevered firm, right? Okay. So, that invest ka na. For us to replicate this position, okay, what do we do? We borrow debt on our own as an investor. Diba? We are investing in an unlevered firm. Walang utang yung firm na yan. So, kahit wala siyang utang as a company, I can replicate a levered position because I can borrow debt on my own. So I can borrow. And if I borrow, the investment is negative. Inflow yan eh, right? So it offsets the investment, the amount that I invested. Okay, so it's negative 1% times DL. Okay? So if I add these two, get the summation, okay? It's 1% of VU minus DL, okay? Which is actually equal to 1% of VE or the value of equity. No? That's unlevered. Okay? Now, let's look at return. How much will you get in return? Your investment mo will earn 1% times the profit of an unlevered firm. Okay? But you are going to pay interest, right? Because you borrowed. Correct? And since you borrowed, okay, you'll pay 1% of the of the amount of interest. Okay? If you sum it all together, it becomes 1% of the profit of an unlevered firm minus the interest. Okay? 
And therefore, it becomes 1% profit times profit of a levered firm. No? And since this is equal to this, then it must be true that this is equal to this. Okay. So it simply means that leverage at the firm level does not matter because you know investors can always undo leverage or change leverage according to his own personal uh, his own personal uh, choices or who, his own personal utility so depending on risk aversion yeah so therefore it doesn't matter what the, the capital structure of the firm is right so let's have this example of arbitrage opportunity okay or assessing arbitrage opportunities. So suppose there are two firms that are identical, no? each with date one cash flows of 1,400 or 900 respectively, 50-50 rin ang kanilang probability. The firms are identical except for their capital structure. One firm is unlevered and its equity has a market value of 1,010. The other firm borrowed 500 and has equity market value of 500. So the question is, does the MM proposition one hold? And what arbitrage opportunity is available using homemade leverage? So first, we know that it is not holding currently, right? Why? The value of an unlevered firm here the value of an unlevered firm here is equal to 1,000 Okay? The value of a levered firm here is what? Debt is 500 and the market value is 500. So therefore, it's 1,000. And since it's 1,000, obviously, the MM proposition is not holding. Okay? So these prices violate MM proposition one. Okay? Of course, one, one assumption here na hindi debanggit is that dapat Sinabi that they are operating in perfect capital markets. All right? So that we can assume that the MM should hold. Okay? Kasi sinabi niya that, MM, that there should be perfect capital markets. All right? So we concluded here that the MM is not holding. MM proposition one. Now, how do we now get... Uh, an arbitrage opportunity. Okay, the unlevered firm is worth one thousand ten. The levered firm is worth one thousand. Okay. So what do you want to do? Okay, the appropriate strategy here is what: buy low, sell high, right? Since what's low is the levered firm, you want to invest in the levered firm. Right? And you want to sell the unlevered firm. And that's how you get the, the arbitrage opportunity. Okay? So anong ibig sabihin ng buy low? Buy means to invest. So what you want to do is to invest in levered equity and to invest in debt. No, meaning magpautang ka. Mag-invest ka ng equity to the levered firm okay? and magpautang ka sa levered firm. So to be more precise, invest in debt to the levered firm para mas malinaw. Okay? So that's what you want to invest in by what are you selling? Okay? Sell high. You sell or short sell the unlevered equity. Okay? Anong ibig sabihin ng short sell? Okay? Ang ibig sabihin ng short sell is uh, in developed markets may short selling. In the Philippines, I think it's under development. Pwede nang i-short sell soon. No, I think the PSE is um, pursuing that. No, short selling simply means manghihiram ako ng shares na ibebenta ngayon. Okay? Which I don't with which I didn't pay for. So for example, if I short sell AC shares now, ang gagawin ko is I will get some AC shares from my broker, sell it and I'll receive the cash now. However, parang inutang ko siya. After some time, I have to pay my broker. Right? 
and when I pay my broker, I need to pay him in terms of shares also, right? And so therefore, if I pay in terms of shares, depending ko ano yung magiging presyo later on. Correct? So, therefore, later on, what will happen is that the, sh and so short selling means I will receive 1,010 today. And therefore, this, plus this, will give me a $10 cash flow today. No? $10 cash flow today for what? Okay. For cash flows when the economy is good or weak. If the economy is good, my levered equity will be worth 875. No? My debt will be worth 525, including the 5%, um, the 5% uh, interest. Okay. And after a year, the, the unlevered equity, I have to pay 1,400. Kasi yan yung value of the firm, right? After one year. No? And if you sum this all up, the cash flow is zero. No? So you got profit out of nothing, right? And therefore, that's called an arbitrage opportunity. If the economy is weak, the cash flows from levered equity is 375, investment in debt, 525. You have to short, you have to pay back what you borrowed, and that's 900 and therefore you also have zero cash flows. So essentially you got profit with no investment, right? So that's the definition of an arbitrage opportunity, okay? Okay, so that's an example of, a, of how, to, how arbitrage opportunities can arise, okay? So what are some examples of uh, MM1. So one is leveraged recapitalization. What is leveraged recapitalization? Leveraged recapitalization is when a firm uses borrowed funds to pay a large special dividend or repurchase a significant amount of outstanding shares. Anong ibig sabihin yan? Borrowed debt. Then after magborrow, ibinayad niya yung Pera, yung, di ba pag nag ka ng debt, makakatanggap ka ng pera, right? When you receive the, that cash, pay all those cash as dividends, okay? So kumbaga, yung perang ni-raise mo was not invested in assets or in projects, but was used to pay back dividends or to repurchase outstanding shares. So recapitalization ang tawag kasi it was used to change capital, structures. Yun ang purpose niya. That's why it was done. You know, is to uh, alter the capital structure of the firm. Okay? Kaya ang tawag recapitalization. Okay? So under MM propositions, okay? So under the MM propositions, we know that this should not create any value. Okay? And Tandaan, when we say MM, when we say if the MM proposition is valid, it means that we are operating in perfect capital markets. Okay, that is a prerequisite before we say that the MM propositions are in place. So, example, a company is currently an all equity firm operating in a perfect capital market with 50 million shares outstanding that are trading for $4 per share. Harrison plans to increase its leverage by borrowing $80 million and using the funds to purchase $2 million of its outstanding shares. So in effect, Harrison sells debt to raise $80 million in cash and uses the same cash to, cut, to repurchase the shares of the company or a portion of the shares of the company. Okay. So let's see. No? Now, before, initially, ganito yung itsura ng capital structure niya. Okay? Meron siyang equity na 200 million. No? So, nanggaling yan, that's 50 million shares times 4 pesos per share. Okay? So, dahil meron siyang equity na 200 billion for the accounting equation to hold, no? dapat may asset siyang 200 billion. 
Okay? So assets 200 equals liabilities of zero plus equity of 200. Okay? Now, after the borrowing, what happens? Okay? After the borrowing, what happens is that debt increased by 80. No? But remember, the company also received cash of 80. Okay? Right? And therefore, the total assets becomes 280 million. No? So, 280 of asset is equal to 80 of debt plus 200 of equity. So under this case, the value of equity is actually the same, right? There's still 50 million shares outstanding, right? And the value of equity is still 200. So 200. So 200 divided by 50, you're still at 4 pesos per share. Okay? After the share repurchase, which means yung perang 80, pinang bayad na ng equity. So if that happens, ano nangyari? The value of the asset remains at 200. Diba? Nagbago lang yung split, 80 and 120. Okay. So, as far as the value of the firm is concerned, no change. Right? Bakit no change? If you look at this, if dati, the value of assets is 200, today, even though the capital structure is different, the value of assets is still 200. No? So therefore, as far as the value of the firm is concerned, there was no change. If you look at the value of equity, actually, it has no impact also. Specifically, value of equity per share. The share prices didn't change. Right? Why? No, because, because even though the total value of equity is 120, but the number of shares outstanding also was less. Right? Kasi binawasan mo rin eh. Tinake out mo yung equity from 50 to 30. No? So therefore, the value of per share will remain at $4 per share. So no change. So that's why recapitalizations have no value as far as the MM propositions are concerned. Okay. So that's one 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 impact. Okay. Saan nang galing yung uh, reduction? Diba? From 50 million shares naging 30 million shares. Sa saan nang galing yung 20 million reduction, 20 million shares na reduction in total shares outstanding, okay? Remember, the amount is 80 million, okay? And the current price per share is four. So this will result in 20 million shares being bought. No, so the 80 million, 80 million of cash that you have is equivalent to buying out 20 million shares. So kaya siya nabawasan from 50 to 30, okay? All right. So there, okay. Now let's now work towards the second proposition of uh, Modigliani and Miller. Okay, what is the effect of leverage on the risk and return of equity? Right. So that's the next question uh, that we have to uh, think about. Okay. Now, if you look at uh, leverage, in the, 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 the main proposition uh, of Proposition 2 of Patigliani and Miller, it argues that leverage increases the risk of the equity of a firm. Okay? And that's what we, we're, what we are trying to, um, trying to get. Okay? Recall that in our cash flow analysis, let's focus on this table first. Okay. Recall that in our cash flow analysis, nakuha natin to, di ba? 1,400 ang cash flows under a strong economy. 900 ang cash flows under a weak economy. And the value of unlevered equity is 1,000. 
sa nangyang nagaling, 1,150, which is the expected cash flows divided by 1.15. And 15% is the required rate of return of an unlevered equity or unlevered firm. Okay? So, saan naman ito nang galing? Ang expected value niyan is 5.25. Right? Correct? Sa naman yun ng galing? Ah, kasi 5% yung interest rate. So if you get its present value, 1 divided by 1.05, you will arrive at 500. Okay? And then, actually, hindi natin kinuha yung present value ng 875 and 375 kanina, di ba? We just went by the Modigliani and Miller proposition. Okay? Kasi the value of a levered firm is equal to the value of debt plus the value of a levered equity. And under Proposition 1, the value of a levered firm is equal to the value of an unlevered firm. Okay? And since the value of an unlevered firm, let me just erase some items here. Since the value of an unlevered firm is 1,000, therefore the value of a levered firm is 1,000 also. So 1,000 equals debt, which is 500, plus the value of equity, and we were able to derive that the value of equity is equal to 500 also. Okay? Kaya natin nakuha to. Okay? But actually, we didn't get 500 in terms of present value of cash flows. Right? Now we will try to derive 500 as present value of these cash flows. Okay? But first, we need to analyze what happened to the return of levered equity under this scenario. Okay? Let's now focus to on the next. Set a table. Okay. Oops, sorry. So let's now focus on this one. Okay. What happened in this one? Okay. Oops. Yeah. Okay. What is the return of debt? The return of debt here is 5%, regardless of weak and strong, because that's 25 divided by 500 for strong, 25 over 500 for weak. So, pare parehong 5% yan. And therefore, your expected return is 5%. Okay? Yung unlevered firm is 1, 4, so 400 divided by 1,000. Then ito, negative 100 divided by 1,000. Same as what we have computed earlier, no? And therefore, getting the average, that's 15%. If this holds true, then we can compute what is the return of, of levered equity under this case, okay? Let's compute. Under the strong economy, no? Under strong economy, what is the return of levered, of a levered economy, of a levered uh, position, levered equity? So that's 875, this one, minus 500 divided by 500. Pag weak economy naman, that's 375 minus 500 over 500. Right? And if you compute the two, that is 75% if the economy is strong. No? And negative 25% if the economy is weak. And to get the expected return, no? That's 75% times the probability, which is 50%, plus negative 25% times the probability of 50%. And we get the expected return of 25%. Okay. What happened? Okay. Because the risk of the project is the same, okay. the risk of the project is the same, the presence of debt, what happened to equity? the expected return on equity increased as a result of the presence of debt, okay? So investors in levered equity will require a higher expected return to compensate for the increased risk as equity holders, okay? Increased risk as equity holders. Why are there increased risk as far as they are concerned as equity holders, okay? Bakit may increased risk? Dati kasi, yung 1.4, sa kanila yan, kung an, dati, nung unlevered pa, okay? yung 1.4, sila ang makakakuha niya ng buo. Right? 
Pero dahil nagka-debt na, magka-cut si debt ng 525. No? So therefore, tumataas ang probability na hindi sila makakabawi. Right? Or not necessarily hindi, hindi tumataas ang probability. You know? But nagkakaroon ng greater variability on the return that they are getting. Okay? Dati ang range lang ganito, 40 to negative 10. Ngayon, ang range ganito na, 75 to 25. That's greater risk, right? Because the range of possible outcomes is so wide already. No? And because the range of possible outcomes is wide, of course, the risk also na they are going to recoup their money will also increase. And therefore, the expected return increases. All right? So that's the, I guess, the theory behind uh, Modibigliani and Miller Proposition 2. Okay? So the returns to equity holders are very different with and without leverage. Yung unlevered pa, 40 or 10%, negative 10%, Kulang yan, negative 10%. Okay. For levered equity, the range is higher, 75 to negative 25. So to compensate for this higher variability, levered equity holders should be able to receive higher expected returns. Okay. So the relationship between risk and return can be evaluated more formally by computing the sensitivity of each security's return to the systematic risk of the economy. Okay. So here, the delta here is strong versus weak. Okay. That's the return sensitivity. Okay? Yung debt, the return sensitivity is zero. Kasi regardless if the economy is strong or weak, they will receive 5%. So their return sensitivity is zero. So therefore, the risk premium that they are also demanding is zero. Why? Because safe yung kanilang investment. Eh. Safe, yung, safe yung pautang nila regardless of the market outcome. So risk-free. Okay? For a levered firm naman, what's the return sensitivity if the economy is strong or bad? 40 minus negative 10%, 50%. And that 50% variability or return sensitivity translates into a 10% risk premium. And since the levered equity's range of possibilities is wider, the systematic risk, the, the return sensitivity is 100%, then they are requiring a higher risk premium. Risk premium, meaning risk premium is equal to risk-free rate minus the, ex the expected rate of return. Okay? So that's 25 minus 5. 20% yung kanilang risk premium. Okay? So in summary, in case of the perfect, in case of perfect capital markets, if the firm is 100% equity financed, the equity holders will require a 15% return. When you finance it with debt and equity, the risk premium increased diba, as a result of it. Okay? So leverage increases the risk of equity even when there is no risk that the firm will default. You know, the, the risk of the firm did not change, but the risk to equity holders increased. Okay? And that's how we derive um, Bodigliani and Miller Proposition 2, or the second theory, fundamental theory of capital structure. No? We first derive, we derive this by establishing that the value of an unlevered firm this is value of a levered firm is value of an unlevered firm is equal to the value of an unlevered firm. That is according to Proposition 1. And an unlevered firm is this one. Value of equity plus value of the debt is equal to the value of an unlevered firm. Okay. Which is also equal to the value of the assets of a firm. Right? Okay. You can look at this equation and, de and determine that this is actually a portfolio. Right? Because the, val the value of an unlevered firm can be replicated, right, using homemade leverage by holding a portfolio of equity and debt. Diba? And therefore, the return on unlevered equity okay, is related to the returns of levered equity and debt. So if you look at this as two portfolios, this portfolio has a return, 
this portfolio has a return. And since these two portfolios have the same valuation, no, their return should be equal. Right? So rearranging, nilagay ko lang yan dito at nilagay ko dito ito. Okay? Therefore, the return of an unlevered firm is equal to the weighted average. Okay? Of the return of return on equity, return on the equity of the on the on levered equity, and return on the debt, okay, multiplied by their respective weights in the portfolio. Okay, and rearranging solving for RE. If you arrange it, rearrange it, and solve for RE, you will arrive at this one. Okay. The return on levered equity, remember RE here is levered equity. Huh? The return on levered equity is equal to the return of an unlevered firm plus debt over equity times the premium. No? RU, which is the return on an unlevered equity minus the return on debt. Okay. What is the uh, implication of this? The risk, the, the return required by equity you know, is directly proportional to the amount of debt in the capital structure. Okay? So the required rate of return of levered equity increases as the debt in the capital structure also increases. Okay? Now, if debt is zero, this is zero. Right, and therefore the return of unlevered equity is equal to the return of, of the assets of the company. Okay, and that summarizes what proposition two is. Right. So that essentially is. Modigliani and Miller Proposition 2. Okay? So the cost of capital of levered equity is equal to the cost of capital of an, of an unlevered equity plus a premium. This premium. Okay? That is proportional to the market value of debt to equity ratio, which is this one. Okay? So the examples, so the required rate of return of equity holders of an unlevered firm is 12% in this example. Its current asset value is $100,000, okay? A similar company is levered with asset value of also $100,000, but funded by 60% debt, okay? Thus, its debt is $60,000 and equity value is $40,000. Since we since Modigliani and Miller um, holds, no? its debt is equal to the risk free rate of five percent. Calculate the required rate of return of equity of levered equity. So we use this. How do we apply this? The required rate of return of levered equity is equal to the return of an unlevered equity. In this case, twelve percent plus market values of debt over equity. Debt is 60%, equity is 40%. No? And then return on levered equity is 12% minus 5%, which is the risk free rate. And therefore, the required rate of return of levered equity is 22.5%. Okay? Now, if you want to further check, no? the return of unlevered equity should be equal to what? equity over debt plus equity times the return on equity plus debt over debt plus equity times the return on debt, okay? So if you compute this, this is 40,000 over 100,000. Sorry, I'm referring to debt to equity, to, to equity here, no? times 22.5%. 
plus 60 over 100,000 times the cost of debt. In this case, it's 5%. You should be able to arrive at 12%, which is RU, which is equivalent to the R2 yeah, given return of equity holders of an unlevered firm. Okay. Now, what are the implications of MM2 or the Proposition 2? So if a levered firm is unlevered, all of the free cash flows generated by its assets are paid out to its equity holders. Okay? And therefore, the market value, risk, and cost of capital of the firm's asset and its equity coincide. And therefore, return on, an un return on unlevered equity is equal to the required rate of return on the assets of the company. Okay? If a firm is a levered project, the return on the assets is equal to the firm's weighted average cost of capital. Okay? And the weighted average cost of capital is computed this way. Okay? E over E plus D, which is the proportion of equity times the required rate of return on equity. Okay? Debt over D plus E plus D is the proportion of debt in the capital structure times the required rate of return of debt. Okay. Now, take note that taxes not included for now. Okay, but we will analyze next week what is the effect of taxes. Okay, so we will we will clarify this further next meeting. Okay. Therefore, the following are all equivalent when we talk about the return of unlevered equity. It's equal also to the required rate of return on the assets of the company which is also equal to the WAC of a company, okay? So those are fundamental, important relationships, okay? So again, another implication of MM2 is that WAC remains, the WAC of a company remains constant, okay? So with perfect capital markets, a firm's work is independent of its capital structure, okay? Because regardless of the capital structure mix, the return on unlevered equity should stay the same, okay? And since a return of unlevered equity is equal to work, then work should also stay the same, okay? So equity, debt, and weighted average cost of capital for different amounts of leverage should be the same. So here, if you look at this example, you know, as the debt to X to value or debt to D over E plus D increases, as debt increases, what happens, okay? The required rate of return of equity, of equity should also increase, okay? Right, because the, because the cost of debt is low. Okay, so that the weighted average will stay the same. Okay, understand? Okay. Of course, uh, if you look at this graph, hindi technically possible yung 100% debt, right? Right, but theoretically, Okay, if it approaches uh, at some point, the cost of debt will increase sharply. Okay, because kailangan ma satisfy yung relationship, no, that the work should stay constant. Okay, so that it will rise at some point where the increase in cost of equity is too high already. No? so that it maintains this relationship. But of course, it's impossible to have a firm na 100%, probably 90 plus, no? but hindi pwedeng walang may are, right? So that's something that, that of course, is a limitation of the, uh, of the theory. Example, so Honeywell International has a market debt to equity ratio of 0.5. So for every 0.5 debt, there is uh, $1 of equity, okay? 
So debt, remember debt to equity ratio. Debt to equity ratio means 0.5 is to one, right? So for every dollar of equity invested, there's a 0.5 dollar that is a debt, okay? Assume its current debt cost of capital is 6.5% and its equity cost of capital is 14%, okay? If the company issues equity and uses the proceeds to repay its debt, so recapitalization ang gagawin niya, to reduce its debt to equity ratio to 0.4, it will lower its debt across debt cost of capital to 5.7 to 5%. With perfect capital markets, what would be the effect of this transaction on the equity cost of capital and what? How do we solve this? First, we need to understand uh, what is the current weighted average cost of capital. Kasi RWAC is equal to the cost of an unlevered firm. And we need the cost of an unlevered firm to get the new cost of equity, right? So that we can use the MM propositions, right? So the current work is proportion of a debt, so 0.5 over 0.5 plus 1. Bakit 0.5 plus 1? Remember, for every point, for every $1 of equity, there is a 0.5 investment of debt. So for every 0.5, may one na equity, eh, ang, ang denominator, debt plus equity. So one plus 0.5, okay? Times 6.5%, which is the debt cost of capital here, okay? Plus equity over debt plus equity, one over 1.5, times the current cost of, cost of equity, which is, 15%. So therefore, computing this, you get 11.5% no, the return of unlevered equity. Using this, we can calculate the new cost of equity at the lower capital structure, right? Because the risk-free rate is 11.5%. i sorry, the RU. Remember, this formula is RE equals RU plus debt to equity ratio times RU minus RD, RU is 11.5%. Debt to equity ratio new is 0.4, okay? And this is 11.5, which is RU, 6.5, which is RD. It results to a new work after recapitalization of 13.8%. Okay, so the equity cost of capital you know, decreases you know, from 14% to 13.8%, okay? Given this, what is the effect on WAC, okay? What is the WAC after the recapitalization? So we compute it again. We call, we call that the WAC is equal to what? No? Is equal to RU, okay? And RU is also equal to debt over debt plus equity times RD plus equity over debt plus equity times RE, okay? So debt over the new debt equity ratio is 0.4. So that's 0.4 over 0.4 plus one. No? No, and then this is the it will result in an 11.5% RU. Okay. Now let's extend it further on betas. Okay. So recall that, uh, recall that this is the, the computation of uh, unlevered return, okay? Each of these returns okay, can be estimated by CAPM. No? And all components of CAPM are common across the three securities or the three parts of the portfolio, except for its beta. Right? Thus, we can 
we can surmise no, that the beta of an unlevered equity is equal to the proportion of equity times the beta of equity times the proportion of debt times the beta of debt. And solving for beta of equity, we have the same relationship as return. The beta of an unlevered firm equals, of, of a levered equity is equal to the beta of an unlevered equity plus T over E times BU minus BT. Okay, so the theory here is that um, if you use cap M, Across the three returns, RF, RM, are all the same. Correct? So what causes the differences in these returns? The beta are different. And so we can get the same relationships out of this uh, uh, equation. So... Since the bit, so there is a, and it arises na merong tinatawag na unlevered and levered beta. Okay? And that's what we got last in the previous slide. Okay? This is called unlevered beta. It is the beta of an unlevered equity. This naman is called levered beta which is the beta of a levered company. Okay. And, and those are critical uh, aspects when we talk about critical aspects when we talk about cap cost of capital and capital structure later on. Okay. So let's look at the problem. Suppose a company has an equity beta of 0.8 and a debt and the debt beta is zero. Suppose CVS was to increase so that its debt equity ratio is now 0.5. Assuming its debt beta is still zero, what would you expect as its equity beta you know, after the increase in leverage? Okay. Let's try to solve this. You know. Okay, sorry. Susulat ko pala siya. Recall, recall that this is the, com the computation of equity beta, which is equivalent to what we discussed about the term. So let's look at this. So equity beta is equal to the unlevered beta, okay, plus uh, debt over equity times beta unlevered minus beta debt, okay? So currently, the equity beta is 0.8, okay? The debt beta is zero, okay? So beta unlevered is equal to one plus, ah, uh, sorry, plus, beta unlevered, plus D, which is 0.5, times beta unlevered, okay? So computing, you can get beta unlevered, which is uh, 0.8 equals beta unlevered equals 1.5, uh, plus times 1.5, okay? Beta unlevered is 0.8 divided by 1.5, okay? How much is that? Hello? Sorry, I, uh, I think I'm breaking up a little. So if you compute that, the beta unlevered is 0.533. And if you know the beta unlevered, no? Then, when you increase the leverage, you know, what is the expected beta levered, levered beta, okay? 
it should increase because debt will increase and therefore this term will increase, okay? Next example, let's look at recapitalization again, okay? So Cisco had a market capitalization of 140 billion in August, 2015. It had debt of 25.4 billion as uh, cash and cash equivalents of 140 billion. It had debt of 25. billion as well as cash and short cost equivalents of 60.4 billion. Its equity beta was 1.09 and its debt was approximately zero. What was Cisco's enterprise value at the time and given the risk free rate of 2% and a market risk premium of 5%, estimate the unlevered cost of capital using capital. So here, because Cisco has 25.4 billion of in debt no, and 60.4 billion in cash, the net debt of Cisco is 25.4 minus 60 billion, so negative 35.0 billion. Okay? And therefore, its enterprise value was 140 billion minus 35 billion or 105 billion. I think we have to define several aspects here. No? When we talk about enterprise value, what does it mean? Okay. Now, enterprise value simply means the value of the business. No, but the but cash technically is not part of the business. It's not part of continuing operations. Right? Part yan ng value today. No, and it is not part of the present value of future operations. Okay. So that's, that, that's why usually how we treat cash in cost of capital or capital structure considerations is that cash is a reduction in debt. It's treated as a reduction in debt. Okay? So for example, sabi ang market value ng debt, for example, 30 million. Tapos may cash balance ka na 1 million. No, in capital structure, what is considered as debt is 29 million because you can pay 1 million definitely now, di ba? So parang ganun yung concept ng cash and the cost of capital. It offsets debt. Okay? And because it offsets debt, it also is offset if it also offsets value. Okay? Future value, present value of future cash flows. Okay? So kaya in terms of capital structure decisions, they are regardless as regarded as a deduction in total capital. Okay, so that's why in this case, what happened? Okay, the total value of debt is twenty five point four billion. The cash is sixty point four billion. So the net debt is negative thirty five billion to consider the value of cash. And since enterprise value considers future, all future value, no, correct? So the total market capitalization of 140 billion, okay, minus 35 billion, that is 105 billion. Ito ngayon yung tinatawag na enterprise value, okay? So to all compute the unlevered beta of Cisco, no, we use this equation. No? So proportion of equity times the beta of equity, proportion of debt times the beta of debt. Okay? In this case, total equity is 140 billion okay? divided by 105, which is the, um, the value no, of uh, equity, no, a value of equity plus value of debt, okay, times 1.09. 1.09 is the current equity beta, okay, plus negative 35 is debt over 105, but the value, the beta of debt is zero. So therefore, the unlevered beta is 1.45. Okay, and the impact is that under negative ang leverage ng company because it has so much cash, actually, it can pay out $35, $35 million of recapitalization. Okay. Kaya, kumbaga, 
May debt nga siya sa kanyang books, which is uh, 25.4 billion. But it has so much excess cash that actually doesn't need the debt. And in fact, can pay, can, can pay more in terms of dividends na 35 billion. Okay? Kaya negative siya sa capital structure. Kasi the economic impact is that there's really no need for debt. Nasa books lang yung debt, pero effectively, because ang dami niyang cash, kaya niyang ubusin yung debt. So in economic sense, um, it's as if wala siyang debt. In fact, it's as if it has so much cash that it has the ability to repay so much dividends. No, kaya yung ginamit natin E plus D dito sa denominator is 105. Okay? To reflect that. Okay? Okay, let's go to the next slide. So the next question that we have to answer is uh, related to our first session. So will increasing the EPS actually increasing EPS by increasing leverage will it actually increase for value? Which answers the question that Nahani last meeting. Will uh, the EPS analysis give us the proper capital structure of the firm. So the theory behind this is leverage can increase the firm's EPS and because the EPS will increase, stock prices should be increasing in value also. Right? Now, is it valid under the MM world? No? And that's what we will analyze now. So let's consider this one. The company is currently an all equity firm. It expects to generate earnings before interest taxes of uh, 10 million over the next year. Okay. Currently, the company has 10 million shares outstanding and its stock is trading at a price of 750 per share. Okay. The company is considering changing its capital structure by borrowing 15 million at an interest rate of 8% and using the proceeds to repurchase 2 million shares at 7.5. Per share. Okay. Now let's check this. You know, what is the EPS at status quo? The net income or the EBIT. The net income is equal to EBIT since there's no interest in taxes. Okay. Uh, the net income is 10 million. Okay. The shares outstanding is also 10 million, and therefore EPS is one. Okay. After the capitalization, what happens? You know, the net income will be lower. Why will it be lower? Because Yung 10 million dati, mabawasan ng interest. How much is the interest? 8% of 15 million. In all in all, the new net income will be 8.8 million. By the way, this assumes that there will be no taxes. Okay. With that, with that proceeds, we believe we will hinder out 2 million shares. No, we will buy back 2 million shares. And so therefore, the number of shares of standing will decrease to 8 million. Right? And with that, the EPS will be higher. So the EPS will now be 1.1. 1 .1. So, and uh, this is validated by our previous discussion last week about the EBIT EPS analysis. So the increase in debt will increase the EPS. Okay. Now let's analyze. Is there really an, a, a, an effect on value you know, of this increase in EPS? Well, the question is, are shareholders well off? No, in reality, no. no. Or under the Modigliani and Miller world, no. no. The expected increase in EPS rises with leverage, but the risk on this EPS also increases. No, so while the EPS will increase, the risk will also increase. So all in all, the value will offset each other. So that's the answer. So to be able to validate this, that there is no, that shareholders are really not well off, then we need to look at a valuation rather than EPS alone. So let's look at this, okay? So assume that the EBIT is not expected to go in the future. So it's 10 million up to the future and that all earnings are paid as dividends, okay? Using the two propositions to show that the increase in expected EPS will not lead to an increase in, value, in share price. Let's look at the following. Okay? So without leverage, expected earnings per share and therefore dividends 
R1 dollar each. Value din na pag yung, yung status ko natin. Given that it's uh, in, in, in the share price, okay, currently is 750. Since we are living in a world that is perfect, no? so therefore the price in lahat yan. So we can actually compute the return required under status quo. Right? The current share price is 750. Okay? Dividends can be determined because dividends is equal to EPS. Right? So this is equal to 1. With this, we can compute how much is the return on the unlevered equity. Okay? So this is just using um, present value concepts because this is present value of a perpetuity. Okay? And that's present value of cash flow. The present value is 150. The perpetual cash flow is $1. So, compute mo what is the return. With that, we're able to compute that the unlevered equity return is 13.33%. After the transaction, what happens? Okay, What is the new debt to equity ratio? The ratio ng debt na 15 million, okay? And then equity 60 million na lang. Saan ang galing ng 60 million na yan? The share price is um, 750 times 8 million. Shares. Okay? So the new debt to equity ratio is 1 over 4. So using MM2, the new return on equity is what? We use this formula. So the return on a levered firm or a levered equity is 13.33, which is this one, plus the new debt to equity ratio of one is the four, times 13.33 minus 8%. 8% was given as the cost of debt, okay? And therefore, the new return on equity is 14.66. Given this, the expected EPS is now 1.1 per share after recapitalization, right? And therefore, the dividends will also be higher at 1.1 per share. So, however, the return is also, the required rate of return is also higher. Hindi na siya 13.33, 14.66 na siya in consideration of higher risk. So therefore, if you get this present value of perpetual cash flows, you will arrive at 750 per share. So therefore, this proves that even though the EPS is higher, but due to additional risk, shareholders will demand a higher return. And therefore, the effects will cancel out each other and the price will remain unchanged. So under the Botigliani and Miller world, okay, an increase in leverage, which increases the EPS, actually has no impact on share price because the expected return will also increase because the risk will increase. So risk of equity holders will increase. Okay? Next, when equity issuance reduce the value of equity due to dilution. Okay? What is, a, what is dilution? Dilution is an increase in the total uh, of shares that will divide a fixed amount of earnings. So parang dati, 10 million shares lang. So yung kanina, di ba? Yung kanina, ano yung kanina? The example. The earnings is 10 million. The number of shares is 10 million. So 1 million per share, a uh, 1 dollar per share. There is dilution if the issue ka ng further equity, dumami yung shareholders. And so, the dilute ka, there is less earnings for per share because there are now many shareholders, many more shareholders versus the status quo. Okay? Sometimes it is incorrectly argued that issuing equity will dilute existing shareholders' uh, value. Therefore, debt financing should be used instead. But actually, that's not true. Okay? Ito yung kabalik taran, parang nag deleverage ka. Ginawasan mo yung leverage, something like that. Okay. So suppose a company is currently currently has no debt and 500 million shares of stock outstanding, which is currently trading at a price of $16. Okay. And then the company announced that it will expand you know, and require the purchase of 1, mil 1 billion new pains. So kailangan um, all 200 million. 
and it will be financed by issuing new equity. So, prior to the equity issuance, you know, the equity and the assets of the firm is eight billion, okay, which is five hundred million shares times sixteen dollars per share, eight billion dollars, okay, and it's unlevered, no debt. So the value of assets is also eight billion dollars. Now, suppose the company sells 62.5 million shares at the current price of 16 to raise 1 billion needed to purchase the things. Okay? Let's look at the value impact under the Modigliani and Miller world. Okay? Before the issuance, no? before the issuance, it's equity. Before the equity issue, the value of its assets is eight billion, and its equity is composed of five hundred million at sixteen per share. Okay, but after the equity issuance, what happens? Okay, its existing assets is still eight billion. Okay, but you actually receive cash of one billion, so the total market value of assets is nine billion. Okay, and with fifty six. 562.5 shares outstanding, it will still arrive at the 16 dollar per value, per share value. Bakit? Kasi nag increase din yung value of assets because you have cash. Okay? So therefore, the value of equity remains unchanged in this case. Okay? So the market value of the assets grows because of the, of the 1 billion additional cash. You also, although the number of shares have grown to 562.5 billion, the share values unchanged because the value of assets didn't change or increase along with the increase in equity. Okay. So therefore, dilutions won't reduce equity values. Okay. And therefore, we, 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 we determine what's called the law of conservation of value. Okay. So the conservation, conservation of value principle for inefficient markets uh, simply means that with perfect capital markets, financial transactions neither add nor destroy value. By financial, no, it refers to capital structure. Okay. But instead, represent a repackaging of risk or reallocation of risk between debt and equity shareholders, equity uh, holders. Okay. So the bottom line of the new decline in middle propositions, there are there is no optimal capital structure because it does not add value. So there's no need to really, really pour over a lot of sweat and tears over it, because. You know, Regardless of the fur of the capital structure, it will not add to the value of the firm. No? It will not add to the value of, or to the return of equity shareholders okay? or equity holders. Okay? So it doesn't make sense. So no need to, to belabor it. But the new essence of Adam Modigliani and Miller uh, rules. Okay. But of course. It's not really a perfect theory. You know, why, is it, why is it not a perfect theory? Because there are a lot of assumptions. Okay? So some traditionalists argue that the MM model overestimates the increase in the return on equity when leverage is relatively low. Okay? It underestimates the increase in return on equity when leverage starts to reach excessive levels. This is because hindi naman instantaneous yung reaction ng equity holders when there is new debt, right? And di ba, the argument always is that uh, hindi kailangan mag, mag belabor ng uh, capital structure policy because shareholders can create their own leverage, right? I can always replicate the portfolio or I, I can always increase or decrease the leverage as, a, as an investor at my level, okay? That's why we're natin yung homemade leverage and replicating portfolios. Right? But that assumes that the company can borrow or lend at the same rate as the firm. 
Oh, sorry, I have to correct that. Uh, that assumes that the investor can borrow and lend at the same rate as firms, which is not necessarily the case, right? So that's a fundamental question. It is only valid if um, the company can also borrow or lend at the same cost of debt as the firm, which we know in reality might not necessarily be true, right? So it puts a question mark on whether the MM uh, proposition actually holds, okay? Another question is taxes, right? We didn't consider taxes in all of this, okay? Um, will it matter? Especially because my tax as an individual investor is different from the tax of a of company. So may differences kami in taxes. So baka hindi ko ma-replicate fully, right? Yung portfolio. Uh, so therefore, if that's the case, there might be instances where there's an optimal capital structure, right? And this is something that we will explore next week. No, as we relax the assumptions of the Modigliani and Miller theory. No, and by relaxing those assumptions, we understand the levers of capital structure policy. Okay? So let's answer this. Okay? A company has common stock with a market value of 200 million and debt with a value of 100 million. Investors expect a 15% return on the stock and a 6% return on them as of perfect capital markets. So therefore, MM world exists, okay? Suppose the company issues 100 million of new stock to buy back debt, what is the expected return of the stock after this transaction, okay? So here, we know that the currently, for us to determine this, we need to get so, ang gagamitin natin ito. Right? The return on equity, uh, the return on levered equity is equal to sorry. Return on levered equity is equal to uh, return on an unlevered equity plus T over E times return on a levered equity minus return on debt. Okay, so let's try to explore that. RU plus T over E, RU minus RD, right? So we need to understand how much is RU first currently. So RU is what? Okay proportion of debt, so 100 million over 300 million, diba? Okay. Times debt, which is 6% plus equity of 200 over 300, okay? 15%. So from there, you can get the return on unlevered equity. How much is that? So that's one third times six percent. So this is two percent plus two thirds of fifteen percent. So that is ten percent. So R U is twelve percent. With that, you know that R E is equal to R U twelve percent. Plus the new DE ratio, what is the new DE ratio? Okay. Issues 100 million of common stock, right? To buy back the debt. Okay. So, ibig sabihin, bababa yung debt. Right? Magiging, what will be the new debt? So, that debt, debt is at 200, magiging 100 na lang. Right? So, 100 over equity. Magkano na yung equity? 200 na. Dati, 100 lang. Times RU minus RD, 12% minus RD, which is 6%. Okay? So, with that, you can get the return on, the, the new return on levered equity, okay? which is 12% plus uh, 
per percent plus this is this is uh, six percent divided by two three percent is equal to fifteen percent. Okay. So that's how you that's the impact. Okay. Let's answer the next one. Uh, sorry, I can't seem to erase what's written here. So let's answer letter B. What happens in letter B? Suppose instead GE issues 50 million new debt to repurchase stock. Okay. If the risk of the debt does not change, what is the expected return of the stock after this transaction? So we do the same thing. Okay. Uh, hindi na natin kaya recompute ulit yung RU. Same pa rin naman yun eh. RU will still be 12%. Okay. Now what is the new debt? Okay. So from 100, ah, parang pala yung ginawa ko kanina, sorry. Mano yung basa ko sa given. Ulitin natin yung kanina, sorry. The given is that common stock is 200, debt is 100. Okay, that is the status quo. So, tama yung 12%. Okay? Pero the new is that nag-issue ng 100 na additional, 300, so to buy back debt na 100 million. So, it became zero debt. I'm so sorry. Okay, let's recompute that. Okay? So, RE is equal to RU, 12%, plus... This becomes zero now. Zero debt over 300 equity times 12% minus 6%. So this is zero. So RE becomes 12%, which is equal to RU. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I read I read the uh, yung basa ko sa given. Okay. So this is the answer: 12% per letter B. Okay. Let's proceed to letter B. Okay. Now, assuming that the uh, instead issues 50 million of new debt you know, to repurchase stock. Okay, so the common stock is now 150. Kasi yung debt. At yung equity. debt 150. So it now became a 50-50 debt to equity ratio. Okay. What is the expected return of the stock? We don't need to change RU. RU will still be 12%. Okay. So with that, we can compute for RE. 12% plus 150 over 150 times 12% minus 6%. So it costs 18%. That's RE. If the risk in debt increases, would the expected return of the stock be higher or lower than part one? Okay. Yes. No. Okay. Why? If the risk of the debt increases, would part one meaning ito pala. If the risk of the debt increases, would the expected return of the stock be higher or lower than part I meaning this one? Okay. So if the risk of debt increases, what happens to the cost of debt, of course, it will also increase. And if the cost of debt increases, this portion will increase, right? Now, if this increases, then this entire term will be lower, right? And so, therefore, the RE under part two will be what? Higher or lower? Lower than RE in part one. 
Why is that the case? Parang risk shifting kasi yan eh. The total risk of a company is the thing. Nasi-shift lang between equity and debt. Now, if debt's risk increases, it means makukuha lang yan from equity. Conserve the total risk of the company. Okay? So that's why the answer in part 2 is RE of question 2, double I, is lower than the RE of single I. Because if debt increases, the cost of debt will increase. And therefore, this term will have a lower number. Okay? It's just a matter of risk allocation or risk shifting among the two. Okay? And lastly, let's go to the last question. Last seat work supposed to be. Okay. Suppose alpha and omega have identical assets and generate identical cash flows. Alpha is an all equity firm with, a, with 10 million shares outstanding that trade at a price of $22 per share. Okay. Omega is 20 million shares outstanding with a debt of 60 million. The first question is under M M1. What is the stock price of Omega technology? So Alpha, in this case, is the unlevered firm. Omega is the levered firm. They have this identical assets and identical cash flows. Therefore, they should have the same firm value. Right? So here, the firm value of Alpha is equal to what? The value of equity of Alpha because it is on all equity firm. So that's 10 million times $22 per share, then it is worth to 20 million. Okay. Now, if alpha and omega are identical, the value of the firm of omega is equal to the value of the firm of alpha, right? Which is 220 million. And the stock price. So you have to deduct the debt. And the value of the debt of omega is 60 million. So therefore, okay, the value of equity is 160 million. Okay. Suppose the company is trading for 11 per share, okay, the Omega Technology stock. What arbitrage opportunity is available? What assumptions are necessary to exploit this opportunity? Okay. So if it is trading at 11 per share, you need to understand. Ano ba ang value of the firm of the two? So, yung value ng value of alpha, value of the firm value of alpha is 220 million. So, you need to check ang firm value ba ng omega to 20 rin. Okay? So, the value of the firm of omega okay, is equal to what? Value of the debt of omega plus value of equity of omega. Okay? How much is value of debt? 60 million. And the value of equity as it is trading is 11 per share times 20 million shares outstanding. Okay? So if you get this, how much is that? 11 times 20 is 220. No? Plus 60 million to 80 million. So the value the firm value of omega is 280. The firm value of alpha is 220. So what is the uh, arbitrage opportunity available? Buy low, say, sell high, right? So you have to invest. So what will be the strategy? Invest you know, in an unlevered alpha, short sell, okay? Omega. Okay, so that you can get the investment opportunity. How do you then plot the cash flows related to this? Include that as part of the assignment. Okay. So the, an additional assignment part of what I will post you know, is to plot the arbitrage cash flows. 
for a disruptor. Okay. So, binigyan na kita ng clue. Ang, ang, ang rule naman palagi sa arbitrage opportunities, you invest in the asset that has a low uh, low um, low value and you short sell no, or sell the asset which has a high value. Okay. So, try to discover this. No. So, I leave with this I'll discuss this in the next meeting next week. Ito yung una ko discuss and this will be the, the parang introduction to the next meeting. Okay? But try to do it on your own. I did the, an arbitrage opportunity kanina, right? In the previous slide. So you can use that as guide. Pero baliktad yun. No? Ang nangyari doon, short sell the unlevered, no? invest in the level. So try to discover or try to experiment or, or to determine paano pagbaliktad? What will be the appropriate strategy? So it will help you a lot in terms of understanding this topic. Okay? So get that it. Now it was a very long lecture. In fact, I was very tired. But uh, hopefully this will help you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, This is the end of the presentation.